Good evening. Um, they said we don't need mics here, that everybody can speak up and uh, the acoustics should, uh, should take care of things. I want to thank everyone for coming. We're really, really happy to see all these, these faces and know that we're, uh, we're making a difference and I appreciate that. Uh, I want to uh, send a thank you out to Theater Salina for letting us host this here in this wonderful venue. Uh, and while you're here, check out uh, the uh, schedule for next season's plays and musicals that starts in September. And um, also a thank you to Arrow Printing. We had some flyers put out and they covered the cost of those. And Amy Adams, did the uh, slideshow there, and uh, so I want to thank her for that. Um, I was just going to say, in 2014, um, I turned 60, and at a gal's night out, I was complaining and whining about turning the big 6-0. And a very good, very wise friend uh, told me, no, we're going to embrace it. And I took that to heart, uh, pushing myself out of my comfort zone and experiencing things that otherwise I might have let go. And one of those things was attending the Women for Kansas conference over the Labor Day weekend. And I was lucky my daughter Jillian also got to go. In 2013, a group of women, Republicans and Democrats, began meeting with a vision to take back Kansas, wanting to inform, involve, and energize Kansas women, encouraging them to participate in our democracy. They were inspired by the suffragettes. If those women could get so many together in the early 1900s, in this day and age of texting, email, uh, Facebook, getting a group of women together should have been a snap. And over 500 of us gathered that weekend to listen and learn. We heard from Nancy Landon Kassebaum and Kathleen Sebelius and many, many others. And though the ultimate goal of denying Brownback a second term didn't pan out, Women for Kansas chapters sprang up across Kansas with a mission to recruit, motivate and educate women who will actively participate in the process of electing moderates to public office who will advocate for moderate policies. It is more important than ever that we are represented by people supporting moderate views. This goes from local school boards, local city and county commissions, as well as the legislature in Topeka. Please consider joining Women for Kansas. The amendment defeat of a year ago was a great example of what can be accomplished when we work together with our voices and with our votes. As you saw on the flyer over there, one woman can change anything. Many women can change everything. And so now I'd like to turn it over to Sherman and Tim with the Kansas Reflector and let them tell us about So I think the first thing we're supposed to do is briefly introduce ourselves and then um, Sherman will tell you more about the, the business, but and then answer questions. <clears throat> and I would urge you uh, to not hold back and ask good, question, good tough questions. We're ready for anything. Uh, my name is Tim Carpenter. I grew up on a dairy, failed dairy, became a beef cattle operation in Missouri, and uh, went to K-State and got a, an ag degree, ag journalism degree. Worked for United Press International, not the delivery service. It was a wire service like the AP. And then I worked at the Lawrence Journal World, Topeka Capital Journal, and the State House for 15 years and for the past three years worked for the Kansas Reflector. And uh, so I hope to do so for the next five years as well because that's the cutoff point when I retire. So I'm Sherman Smith. I grew up in Lyon County, in a rural part of that county, 
kind of out in the middle of nowhere, literally at the end of a dead end road. Um, went to Emporia State University, uh, got a degree in English and journalism back when they still offered those things. We <laughs> went to the Topeka Capital Journal in 2004, same year that Tim arrived at the Capital Journal. Um, so we worked together for 16 years there, and I, I did any number of things. Um, started as a copy editor, uh, alternative storytelling project, uh, ran the online desk for a while, became the managing editor in uh, late 2015. Uh, and then early in 2018, I decided to uh, assign myself to go over to the State House, work alongside Tim, cover the election, and um, have been a reporter ever since. Fast forward a couple of years to 2020, in uh, the early days of the pandemic, the company that owned the TP Capital Journal, also owns the Salina Journal and the Hutchison paper, uh, they decided this would be a good time to make all of the reporters in their newsrooms all across the country have a one-week furlough every month for, I think, three months, something like that, at a time when we had an unprecedented readership. Right? People didn't know what was happening with this strange new disease that's killing everybody. And um, I said something on uh, Twitter right before it was time to take my furlough. Um, that was probably ill-advised, but I said I was getting ready to do my part to serve the bottom line of shareholders in New Jersey and would take a unpaid week of vacation if you needed to know what was happening in the world, here are reporters who would actually be working the next week. What I didn't know at that time was Clay Wirestone, who I'd worked with at the Topeka Capital Journal and convinced him to come home from New Hampshire. Uh, he grew up here. I was in charge of our copy desk, copy editors at the Capital Journal. Uh, he was working at Kansas Action for Children at that time, and he had met with these people from an outfit called State's Newsroom. Uh, that had come to Kansas trying to see if they could find somebody to establish an affiliate here. Uh, State's Newsroom about five years ago started establishing news organizations like this in states across the country. We were 14, 15, something like that to come online. And their idea was to put journalists back into state houses where the ranks have been depleted over the years. Uh, and they, you know we're in states that have supermajority Democrat control as well as Republican control. Uh, but the idea is that if you have a more informed public, they'll make better decisions about who they vote for. Uh, and so Clay had met with them. They wanted to find somebody in Kansas. He connected them uh, to me after seeing this tweet. They saw the tweet. They said, we want to stop, start something like this here. Very quickly, we were on the same page, and um, that's how Kansas Reflector started. Uh, I turned to Tim, who was getting ready to serve one of his uh, furloughs, and said, would you like to come over here with me? Uh, and he said, yes. Uh, Clay said, this sounds like a stupid idea. I'm not going to do that. <laughs> um, he has a slightly different version of this. But uh, C.J. Janovey was the first opinion editor. Um, of course, she would wrote the definitive book on LGBTQ rights in Kansas, the fight for that over 10 years. She and Kevin Wilmot, who has an Oscar, um, just made a movie version of that book. And I think they screened that in, in Salina here recently. Um, she started as the opinion editor. We had a different reporter, Noah Taborda, initially. Um, after a year, Genevieve had an opportunity to go run kind of the flagship NPR station in the Midwest, and so she took advantage of that. Um, and that's when I brought Clay on board as the, the opinion editor. Uh, last year, we was able to, uh, after Noah went back into to the radio world, we was able to bring Rachel Mepro up from Louisiana. I think she's done a wonderful job covering stories here for us that nobody else has really been aware of. Uh, or it just has not gotten much attention. Um, Excuse me. Yeah. It would be better if you talked a little bit louder. You okay. Sure. I'll do we'll my do. best. Just talk really yeah. loud. <laughs> so the the short version is the Kansas Reflector. We operate as a nonprofit. We get uh, the bulk of our funding comes from State's Newsroom. They're doing the heavy lifting fundraising so we don't have to with people who support the idea of doing journalism as a public good. Uh, I know there's a lot of detractors out there who claim that we're secretly funded by Soros, or this is some sort of Soros conspiracy. <laughs> I would say if you have his number, please put in a good word for us. We would take, you know, whatever support we can get. Um, you know, I have, I talked to editors in other states, though, where there's a supermajority Democrat in uh, control in New Mexico, for instance, and the editor there says, you know, everybody claims we're just this Coke-funded conspiracy group. You know, it's really just... Uh, people trying to hold leadership accountable, hold poli uh, political officials accountable, and that's what, what we're doing. 
Um, we provide our stories for free to anybody who wants them, uh, to other news media. They're free to read. Uh, we don't have advertising. Um, louder. We do ask for local donations, um, which support what we do to be able to travel out to do stories in other parts of the state. Um, we have an internship, that sort of thing. Um, so we appreciate the, the local support. We have a free newsletter that goes out every day that you can sign up for here. Um, and so it's me, Tim, and Rachel primarily doing the news reporting. Clay does the opinion stuff. Uh, I don't tell Clay what to think or what his opinions can be, but I've tasked him with this mission of trying to elevate voices that are typically left out of public policy debate. Uh, and so I think he does a good job of that. Uh, we also have a reporter, Allison Kite, that we share with our Missouri affiliate. Uh, she primarily focuses on environmental issues and I think excited to, to see her take on this new project uh, over the rest of the year, she'll be looking primarily at water issues in central and western Kansas. So that's the, the rundown of who we are. Uh, I'll try to speak up as best I can, but we want to leave as much time for questions as we can. Yeah, please, questions. And if nobody has any questions, I'll start calling on people. <laughs> yes, sir. Wow, rough crowd. Yeah. Allison is actually working on that story. So the deal is Evergy is asking for a big rate increase, and the explanation is they need to put in, I think, a lot more infrastructure to serve this Panasonic plant that's being built in DeSoto, I think yeah. it is. Mm -hmm. um, so she's working on that to, to let people know what's going on, but I think part of that is they're using Panasonic as an excuse to tack a bunch of other stuff onto it, mm -hmm. and we're trying to sort out what all that is and, and what it means. But So the sure. Panasonic plant gets about $800 million from the state of Kansas plus billions from the federal government to build a $4 billion plant in DeSoto. I think the thing you have to remember with, with Evergy is that they have a built-in profit margin for whatever they're spending. And so everything they spend on this infrastructure, they, they can add 10% to that to ship oh, to their shareholders. Right. So, yeah. yeah. So it's always a question of are they building things they need or not? Yeah. I'm going to, sorry, I'm going to interject just a minute. It's my fault there's no mic because this is a huge new experiment for us and the Sina Theater is giving us this space. Can you hear me? Okay. That, you know, we're not actors up here and so we don't all project like maybe actors. But, you know, I was ensured that everybody would be able to hear because the acoustics are so good in here. So please be patient. Um, you guys are going to have to, and I don't know if it helps if they stand up. We can that stand. Would help. Yeah. That might help a little bit. Well, we're recording. We're recording. Um, uh, so we'll just stand up and talk louder. Yeah, I think they need to talk. And I, like I said, we thought it would be great. We want to come back. There's no way to get a mic now tonight, but we know next time we'll get a mic. Okay. okay. I'm, I'm the co-leader with Connie for Women for Kansas. And apparently while I was out of the room, the questions already started. So <laughs> I was going to be the moderator for that. And you, okay. know, you can moderate yourself. We can. I can play referee yes. if I need to. You anyway, enjoy the evening. Please be patient. We do have cake out there at the end. Just pull the whole thing forward. All right. Because there's some kind of microphone on the table. I, uh, anyway. Um, so there's a here and then here. We'll go here. Well, right now, you, we'll have to see what the, what the legislature decides. That's a flat tax where everybody, no, regardless of your income, pays the same percentage. And uh, so it's, it was the Kansas Chamber's number one priority. Certainly the Koch uh, special interest groups were behind it as well. 
And uh, for now, it only matters what one person says about the flat tax, and that's Governor Kelly. And we talked to her last week, and uh, she said she, she warned the House Speaker and the Senate President she would never sign a bill with a flat tax in it. She continued to veto legislation. They didn't believe her, and she vetoed it anyway. And so they ended up with no big, big tax package because that's how much they wanted it. Ty Masterson, the Senate president, the governor claims that's all he cared about, all that other tax policy stuff in those bills. And they were sort of like a, uh, they were just a big uh, a jumble of, of tax giveaways. That's all Ty Masterson really cared about. And so she denied him that. And you're right, they will come back next year with force and you know when you have narrow margins like that to where you're you're not overriding her veto by one or two votes that explains why uh, the governor formed a political action committee to start raising money for the 2024 uh, election cycle to invest in moderates whether they be Republican or Democrat and she wants to, all she has to do in the House, for example, is to get two, two, three, four people added to the mix that are moderates, and she can deal with these vetoes. Uh, she can block the veto overrides on things like the flat tax. I think as a practical matter, I mean, from day one, leadership would be negotiating with the governor on every policy. From day one, the leadership would have to negotiate with the governor on whatever policy they were doing because they wouldn't be able to sustain a, a veto override. Um, and the, one of the casualties here, as Tim alluded to, because of the interest in the flat tax, there are a lot of other tax ideas out there for relief in it, you know, whether it's back to school sales tax relief, uh, getting the food sales tax relief ended sooner. Um, property tax relief, other kinds of tax relief. The, the state has $2 billion or something now in excess and can't figure out how to get tax relief to anybody because all the interest is in the flat tax. Yes, right here. I wondered if you could fill in any information on the energy issue uh, related to their um, pulling back from the pledge to shut down the coal-fired plant near Lawrence uh, and with more renewables and Can That's you my editorial the comment. Yeah, we can. We get the question. Yes. The question is a, a follow-up question on Evergy, uh, wanting to know about why the coal plant in Lawrence is still churning, and the fact that uh, Evergy is largely it's an investor-owned utility, and a lot of the Wall Streeters own it and really don't care about Kansas. They do care about their 10 plus percent profit. But do you know about the plant? So I know Allison wrote about this as well, and I think. Part of it is companies like to get a lot of platitudes when they make the announcements about, you know, we'll, we'll be carbon neutral by 2040 or whatever the date is. And so I think Evergy had just made the promise that they were going to shut this coal plant down by a certain date. And every time it gets closer to that date, they push the, the date out a few years. Um, Well, what did you expect? McPherson County doesn't want a solar farm either? No. They have one, a tiny one, but they don't want any more. They don't want any way out of it. Commissioners in oil. Okay, well, yeah. Oil and gas, but you know, part of the the wind turbines they are gigantic, and make some racket. And if you lived like next door to one, you'd regret it. But the the yeah the solar you can stand under them and hear the whooshing. But anyway, the solar panels with a tree line, you could drive by it and not see it. I I just don't really you know, like totally understand the objection to the solar panels. I I don't know what that's about. Because most of us aren't flying around in our Piper Cub and getting <laughs> blinded by the glare, you know. So I don't know tons about the issue, um, but the, the out-of-state investment thing has always been controversial. And that 
uh, the people largely could care less about where Kansas is hot or cold in, in their homes. They just want to make their money. And I think it's a fair criticism of Evergy. They spend a lot of money in the capital lobbying, too. And it's, our, it's my money they're spending for whatever, whatever ideas they have up their sleeve. So I think that's interesting, too. Yes, sir. Randall Hurdy, I'm former senator. I recognize you. Yeah. Good to see you again. Um, and I, I was just wanting to throw out something about, you know, you talk about the 21st cycle and moderate tax and all that sort of thing. And, and I, I think that um, our problems go a bit deeper than that, in that uh, in, in 2020, when uh, there were six moderates in the Senate, and we were, we were told to, to go by this game plan and, you know, we retain our seats. Well, what we didn't learn was that the other side was, uh, had different ideas. <laughs> and, and, and those different ideas uh, resulted in all six of us being booted from the Senate, Mo all moderates. And, uh, and uh, I think that uh, a lot of that came from the, the fact that, well, there are two things that, that happened. Uh, one is the dark money, the Coke Industries, Americans for Prosperity, flooded all the, the moderate districts uh, with postcards. Mm -hmm. And so I was, I was elected in 2016, uh, you know, reverse the brown act tax policy. In 2020, they took a postcard and said, Hardy raised your taxes by $1.2 billion. Yeah. Uh, when we just brought the LLCs back onto the tax roll. So they, they know how to do their job very well, and you have to applaud them for that. And, and as a result, the Cokes own the Kansas government. In, in a sense, they do. And the, the other part of it is, so dark money, the money is part of it. The other thing is, uh, our elections are determined in the Republican primary. Yeah. And I ran against uh, J.R. Place, who's, who's now yeah. in the seat. And uh, it was a, um, it wasn't a race. It really wasn't a race. Uh, they, they told him he didn't have to knock on one door, didn't have to have one yard, one yard sign, and he didn't. It was the most, it wasn't a campaign at all. And I was out sweating my head off, you know, knocking on doors, and I lost 60 40 mm -hmm. because of all the, 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 the value and the, uh, uh, the effectiveness of all the postcards. And the other thing is in Saline County, we have. The Republicans are 49 percent of uh, the, uh, the voters, and uh, unaffiliated and Democrats 51. And so, the, uh, Republicans don't even have a majority in Saline County. But it only takes that small fraction of the people, um, you know, mostly far right Republicans that are rabid and go to every primary that make all these decisions based on, uh, you know, their ideas and not necessarily what's best. For the, the county as a whole, and it's the unaffiliated voters. I think they're growing. They're, they're not. They don't have a voice, and it's that's where the moderates are. I think to a large degree um, are are the unaffiliated voters who cannot participate in uh, primary elections. So I, mean, I think we're just working against ourselves, and we can, you know. And I don't know if PACs how much good they did me in 2016, frankly. So what you need is a PAC that has somebody running it, donating to it, it has a billion after his name, to compete with Cokes. You need the super PACs. You need the dark money. You can't just have one party going to the dark side like this and burying you. I, I imagine that by the end of that race, you hardly recognize yourself. Well, but in, 20, in 2012, 2012, they did exactly the same thing. They, they went after eight moderate senators and I think got six or seven of them, whatever the number was, and they took out a Senate president, Steve Morris, right. from Southwest Kansas. And Brownback used House members, and they messaged them, they funded them, and they did everything that you just said. They did a lot of mail uh, document dumps and radio ads and stuff like that. Uh, so that stuff is powerful. As far as if, if, you're, if I'm an independent voter, uh, you know, I'm not sure what you get out of that. I, just sign up for the R or D party and vote in the primaries. I, I, I don't think I would give up my opportunity to not vote in the pri primary just to remain independent. And, and I'm a journalist, you know. There, I know journalists that don't uh, vote because they don't want to be accused of being biased. But, you know, we took our kids to the, the election places when they were little to show them how important it was to vote. 
So, but I just think being in one of the parties so you can vote in a primary is important and maybe you could convince all the mods that are independents and closet moderate Republicans to go do that. You know, and, and the other thing that happened in 2012, I'll never forget it, is because it was so out of, out of line, uh, Brownback came out to Saline County and uh, campaigned uh, for Tom Arpke against Pete Brungard. Uh, he, you know, and, and you just don't do that with an incumbent, but he did. Oh, yes, he did. He, he went for the jugular in the 2012 primary and went directly after uh, incumbent Republicans because he was tired of fooling around in the state house with the moderates. He just thought the Republican Party was such and such and didn't want anybody else who believed the Republican Party could be something slightly different. And he got very tired of that. But, you know, interesting about that, uh, the Brownback tax program and the LLC that allowed businesses not to pay any income tax and for individuals to funnel a lot of money through their LLC. Uh, it took a Republican House and Senate because they passed the bill to get rid of the LLC tax break and then Brownback vetoed it. Mm -hmm. They begged him not to veto it and he goes, no way, you know, you're know, you just going to have to climb over my back. And, they, and in this meeting in the basement of the Capitol, they all went upstairs and did exactly that. You know, It took the Republicans and Republican leadership to get away with that, to, to get rid of that tax policy. So for them to turn around and then accuse you of betraying Republicans mm -hmm. is a little hard to take. Yeah, it is. Yeah. Thanks. Yes, sir. So um, if we're not able to outspend the dark money that probably has some coke money in it, is there anything that can ever be done to change this dark money nomination of Politics? Is that just always going to be the way? At the federal are? level. Huh? At the federal level. I think the, the August 2nd vote last year is a reminder that when people are engaged and show up and enforced to, to make their voices heard, that it does make a difference. Um, talking about the constitutional amendment votes last August. And I think that was fueled in part by this surge in participation by young voters, um, particularly 18 to 29 year olds who showed up in record numbers in August. They didn't come back in November, which is part of the, the challenge. Part of that, I think, is making it easier for college kids to vote when they come back to, when they go back to campus, when they're not home anymore. But I think also candidates across the board have to get better at engaging young people on issues that matter to them um, so that they show up. Um, but I think that's the greatest testament to democracy, this idea that you'd have a, a vote that was stacked in, in the favor of one side. It was put on a primary ballot to favor Republicans. It was um, confusingly worded. There was a lot of money behind that. So I think everybody from Jerry Moran to the Catholic Church put a million dollars into that campaign, and it still went down in epic fashion. So what would have to happen to overturn the legality of the dark money? Well, I don't think the legality is going to change anytime. You, Congress would have to pass a federal law yeah. that makes that whole election funding process more transparent. And then they would be challenged before the U.S. Supreme Court, and you might lose. Your you know, question. We did have a campaign finance reform that was passed in the 90s, and it was signed in, and then the, uh, the uh, Supreme Court got it, got it down. Yeah, we got a U.S. Yeah. Supreme Court making some <laughs> peculiar decisions at the moment. Back in the 90s. Yeah. Yeah, got a question. Money well, is speech. I'm just glad to hear from Sue because so far this is women for Kansas and I've only heard men ask questions. <laughs> <laughs> well, I have something I'd like to say. <laughs> <laughs> I'm done. I, I, don't, I don't want to turn this into a debate between me and Mr. Hardy, but I will just remind everyone that in 2012, it was pretty much handwriting on the wall that Arby was going to beat Brownback because he almost beat him the primary before. So I Ar signed Arpey up. Beating, uh, beating, uh, uh, Brungar. 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 I'm in Brungar. I'm in Brungar. Brungar. You're right. I'm tired. But anyway, it was pretty clear that Pete was going to lose that primary because he almost won it four years before. I signed up as a Democrat and ran against RP or whoever won in the primary so that we continued and we actually weren't done in August and we had till November to bring all those independents and those uh, moderate Republicans over to a Democratic candidate. 
We've had Democratic candidates since. Sarah Cruz is sitting right there, an excellent candidate against Clark Sanders. So I'm asking all of you, and I don't, and I think this is so important that I'm going to raise it. Can, Women for Kansas is a nonpartisan organization, but we are not like the League of Women Voters. We can support candidates, and we can talk about this stuff. So. When, when C.J. Janity and Kevin Wilmot were here at the theater and they kept saying, and the audience kept saying, they're doing this and they're doing that, and it was all the LGBTQ issues, I stood up and said that they are the Republicans in the legislature who are doing these things. So it's time to stop, unless you are really benefiting from being a Republican right now, try the other side. I'm telling you, if there was a Democrat in the race that you lost, or that you, it, it, it could have been different. And it's not working the other way. So, so I'm just saying that to get good candidates out there for a two-party system, Dem Democrats need to know that they've got people behind them. Yeah. Well, and you can switch. If you want to vote in the primary next time, go switch back to Republican. Mm -hmm. So I'm just saying Sarah lost, we won a great, ran, ran a great race, got 30%, some obligatory Democratic vote. David's run, I've run, can't, Alan's won a run, and we all just get this obligatory 33 and a third percent out here. We need, and to get candidates to run against the Republicans that you don't like, you have to know, they have to know that they've got support out here. So just keep that in mind as 2024 comes up. The last time a, a Democrat won, uh, won a, a state Senate race in Saline County was 1970. Well, and you know what? I don't care. I'm saying it wasn't working, and you need to try a different way. If you would have asked for moderate Republicans to come over to the, your side as a Democrat, it might, you, you constantly want the moderate Democrats to come over to you, and it didn't work for you this last time. I'm just saying it ended in August when it, we would have had another few months to change that in the November election if it hadn't ended at the primary. So I will be quiet. Thank you. <laughs> Do you have a question? Okay, the <coughs> abortion amendment that was done last year, that wasn't just Democrats, it just wasn't Republicans. And the state house was trying to do everything they could to make sure that nobody would come out and vote. They even tried to finagle the wording and they sent out their little postcards that were kind of wonky. But <coughs> Well, women and men who respect women. Yeah. Let's add the men in there. I, mean, yeah. I have to say that uh, on a, on the just over a year ago, I was sitting there in front of my laptop, assuming the amendment would pass narrowly, which shows you what I know, because <laughs> it got hammered, and it was it was a, a bloodbath, and the uh, proponents of the amendment blame people like Sherman and I. Oh, wow. And uh, I kind of think that's exaggerating our influence a little bit. I'd like to think I could just snap my fingers and get people to do things, but it doesn't work that way. I think that undersells the, the thought process of voters. Well, it and, has a yeah. lot to do with message. Republicans, for some reason, seem to message a whole lot better than Democrats. The opponents of that amendment ran an especially brilliant campaign and messaging was a big part of it. They were in southwest Kansas speaking to people in Spanish. They were speaking to independents and Republicans, talking about, do you want government deciding about your health care, or do you want to decide it? And that kind of message uh, can, can be attractive to even conser some conservatives. You know? they, they framed it entirely as having your rights taken away. Like the government is trying to take your rights away, and they were unwavering from from that. They wouldn't take, you know, any detour off that message. On the drive over here from Topeka this afternoon, we were talking about whether anybody could define the word woke. Oh, yeah. Yeah? Right. Uh, 
<laughs> wherever your surroundings, yes. But, but the, the message from most people when you say woke it's is that it is anti-democrat. And that's because they plagiarize the words. That yeah. word's been around forever. I know. Yeah. I woke well, I up a long time ago. I woke up this morning and now I'm awake. <laughs> <laughs> or I'm aware. So if you want to say, I'd encourage everybody to stand up as they speak so that'll help everybody hear better. And again, I apologize for the uh, hard time, yeah. hard time hearing, but this anyway. is. Um, There's Kate. So. Yeah. In terms of uh, in terms of the messaging, though, I think there's this phenomena where an overwhelming majority of Kansans, I think, are with uh, Democrats on issues of abortion and climate change, Medicaid expansion, legalizing marijuana, some form of of controlling gun use. Um, these are issues that a majority of Kansans are on the same side on, and yet Democrats seem to be afraid to even talk about it on the campaign trail Good on point. some of these issues. So I don't know what the messaging problem is, but you're right. Democrats are really bad at it. Yes, sir. So it's fair to say that a year ago, uh, people turned out and voted because there was a reason to vote. I think it was a moment of clarity where people were voting on a single issue, yes or no. You know, I think there's a lot of other reasons that could influence a vote for a particular candidate. So does, does that also explain why very few people show up to vote for the Democrats? I mean, what's the point of it? Why, why, why should I vote for a Democrat? I mean, really? I mean, what do they do? Well, think, it depends on where you live. It yeah. depends on where you live. Obviously, if you're in Johnson County in that four, whatever, four or five county district, congressional district, you know, the map of Kansas was totally changed for one reason, the congressional map, and to, to defeat yep. Sharice yep. Davids. Yep. And she won by more. So uh, the, the Democrats and independents and I guess Republicans came out in that race because they believed in her. Uh, you know, I, I, I feel your pain. You know, Democrats, straight up Democrats, I think out in Western Kansas have a whole lot of problems about running because it might be people like my late father who is just going to vote for Republicans no matter what. You know, he's just going to wander in there. And when my grandmother came to live with us in the late 1970s, she's a Southern West Virginia, Southern Democrat. And that's back when they had, you went and flipped the handle, you know, if you're as old as I think I am. You remember that. She would go, my dad would go vote Republican and all this, and she'd go in there and there's a big handle if you wanted to vote a straight ticket. And she'd just reach up there and go, clunk, and totally wipe out his ballot, you know, basically. <laughs> Which I found amusing at the time. He was frustrated by it. But so getting these people that are uh, just tried and true Republicans to vote for a Democrat, particularly out in here, just seems especially difficult. And it requires a lot of resources to overcome that. It requires compelling candidates talking about issues that people care about. And I think it's just really hard to get people to move out of their busy lives and to walk down on a Tuesday and vote. And the legislature has not done anybody any favors by making voting harder. You know, no, no drop boxes because there's an alleged uh, threat to uh, you know, the accuracy of the count, no proof. You know, limit advance voting. Make it harder to switch parties from in, in independent. You know, you have a sh you have a, a a longer time span that you can't do that. All these things were made to make voting harder, and only the most dedicated people get to vote in in a, in a convenient way. We should have made it a heck of a lot easier to vote. We should be voting on Saturdays. I think. Right. Right. You know, why not? That's uh, so pending a Supreme Court ruling. Right. Yeah, you may get to do that again, you know, yeah. once they strike that one down. But uh, I know what you're saying. My understanding is that a lot of this goes back to the history of Kansas and the anger that farmers had with FDR way back when he saved their butts by putting in tree lines to stop the wind and so forth. And uh, instead of Oh, you mean the Republican tradition? The Republican tradition. They were going to do anything okay. that was against FDR and the Democrats. Okay, that could be. That was before my time. Mine too. <laughs> Believe it or not. Next question. Uh, how many citizens?
citizens do you think know that an awful lot of the lousy legislation that's being passed in the legislature was not even originated in the state of Kansas? That's a good question. And I'd like to see that. Repeat the question, I'd Chairman. like you to call it out. More often. Every week would be great. <laughs> yeah. so the question is about how many people realize that it seems like the overwhelming majority of legislation is being written by somebody outside of the state of Kansas. Um, you know, this is one of the things as reporters, I think we get so jaded to just the way things happen in the state house that it doesn't even like phase us anymore. But I was at uh, a forum this spring that somebody else was moderating, and um, you know, somebody said, "Where did this bill come from?" They said, "Oh, it's this out-of-state group," and the whole crowd just gasped, like, "Oh God, I can't believe an out-of-state group is actually writing our bills." And I thought. Oh, that's that's the way almost all the bills are being written. So, so we, we do need conservative, to yeah. I think the conservatives organizations really started this first by writing model legislation, mm -hmm. like ALEC and organizations yeah. like that. But it's been kind of adopted by more moderate and liberal organizations too. And maybe if we lived in a state that had Democrat control, we'd see those Democrats and liberal organizations having their model legislation passed. It's just the fact that we have a Republican legislature and except for a a governor and a congressperson, you know, we got a bunch of Republicans in public office in Kansas. So we see the Republican version of that. But in stories, when we know some organization wrote this, and sometimes it's a little hard to figure that out, but sometimes it's not, we try to throw it into stories. You know, this is legislation written by such and such organization in Washington, D.C. Um, but we don't do that on everything because I have to admit, I don't always know where the bills come from, you know? Right. It's the American and Legislative Exchange Council. Council. And so I think Susan Waggle, former Senate president from Wichita, I think she was part of their national organization leadership. She As is Senate President Ty Masterson now. Yeah, I think their fingerprints are on a lot of legislation, right? And Even if it's modified some. Sometimes it's not modified much at all. It's always gradual. Uh -huh. But it's, then now they yeah. become token. We've tried to point out, um, as Tim says, when we know where this is coming from, there's a organization that wrote the, uh, the transgender athlete bill um, that has a long history of anti-LGBTQ you know, policy initiatives. There's an organization based out of Florida that's trying to get the make it harder to get food stamps. Um, they brought in this guy from Texas with an organization that wants to make homelessness illegal. <laughs> Throw people in jail. I mean, for the right donation, you can come in and have a hearing on your bill. So we'll just throw them in jail and then pay for them. That's the idea. Okay. Yeah. Can you say that part again about? They come in and they, they dictate the, the hearings on the bills? I think if you make a sizable enough donation, you can get a hearing on your bill. Oh, yeah. Well, That's some bills get passed with no hearings, I hear. So, so much of the legislation that actually passes comes out of the final 48 to 72 hours of the session. Everything gets bundled together, and sometimes those bundles include things that have never had a hearing. We which had is, a tax bill which with 27. Which is against the rules of the past. Yes, the rules of the, Sherman was saying that in the end of the legislative session, a lot of bills get bundled and stuff appears out of nowhere. 
and it used to be absolutely forbidden. And now it happens periodically during a session and legislators are voting on stuff they've never read, there's been no committee meetings on it, no House or Senate chamber has adopted it. And I think it's, it's you know, a lot of these uh, last four couple days of a legislative session, half of those, that's happening at night. And so people are sleeping and we're doing, massively important public policy is happening when legislators and reporters are tired and worn out and no one is paying attention. And so uh, there's this rush to get out and they put a bunch of pressure on people and you're voting at night. And, you know, they did this a lot uh, right up until 10, 12 years ago, and I remember the debate well, uh, a House member named Bob Bethel, uh, the last moment that the House was in session, made a motion to create a, a Medicaid can care oversight committee, because the program had some problems and he wanted some government oversight. And another representative went down there and, and lacerated him, and, and the, the session broke up, it's uh, early in the morning, and Bob Bethel was driving home to western Kansas and drove off the road and, and died. And so after that, the House adopted some rules where you can't start, I think it's can't start a debate on an issue after midnight. Well, except when you waive the rule. It's called the midnight rule and it's waived every time. The Senate doesn't have a rule like that, I don't believe. And so the, I, the idea of starting debates after midnight I, is terrible. I remember standing on the side of the House floor one time and a, a representative from Eudora wandered down there and just thought, mm, what's coming? He just started a three-hour abortion debate at three o'clock in the morning. And I think it's criminal. <laughs> no, they think, they think that the legis legislators, they, they focus on getting out in within 90 days. Nobody cares about that in the public. They want good public policy that's well heard, transparent, and it, they don't care whether it takes 110 days or 150 days. But there's this built-in mechanism that the legislative leadership manipulates that tries to ram a legislation down lawmakers' throats. And it's all a calculated, it's, it's the program. It's the program to get things adopted uh, in bundled bills. You might have a bundled bill, like what was the record, 27? 27, 27 I don't, in the tax 20, bill. Two yeah. years ago, the, tax, the mega tax bill had 27 bills in it. That's, that should be forbidden. And uh, they kind of make jokes about it this session, like, I don't think it has more than 27, ha, 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 you know? But, I mean, if I'm a legislator, I would be dedicated and try to read legislation. There's no way I can read the 27 bill tax legislation to know what the details of that are. Right, right. Legislators don't want to know, it, know what's in it, lobbyists don't know what's in it, and sure as heck, the public doesn't either. And so, in terms of process, these are the, these are the areas where the legislature's broken. You know, but it's a huge advantage if you're in legislative leadership to use these broken rules to get what you want. So they could put pressure to people like Senator Hardy in the final minutes and say, you have to vote this way or we're running you out in the primary. Right. Right. <laughs> can you repeat that, Sherman? I was just saying they, they can go to somebody like Senator Hardy in those final hours and say, you're gonna vote on these or we're gonna run you out in the primary. Right. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. So with all due respect to all of the old people, um, I think we're all, if we learned anything last August, was that as hard as us older folks um, want to work and want to be a part of this, and it's great, um, there is no way for moderate candidates, Democratic candidates to run, to, to run and successfully run and win a campaign without young voters. And you all cover nationwide, you all cover a lot from Johnson County, so I wondered if you had any insight into um, what they, what the bigger counties in our state did to bring our youth in. We brought our youth in. Saline County beat, Saline County came out in favor of, of blocking the amendment. I mean, so we did it, but we only did it for one vote. Because three months later, none of those kids were back. None of those young adults were back. I'm, I'm working on a story about this phenomenon, actually, and I talked to some experts at Tufts University who track the youth votes. And I think what 
what they've emphasized is that candidates have to actually engage with, with young people on issues that matter to them, including reproductive health rights. They have to talk to young people and not talk down to them. Um, but it's, you know, young people care about finances and they care about the climate. And um, we're dealing with a generation that has been taught in schools how to cover themselves in the blood of their classmates so that they appear to be dead to the mass shooter. You know, they have a very different view of gun legislation than a lot of people our age or older. And so I think candidates have to really make it a priority to engage with young people, to give them a reason to show up in November. I just read a, an article in the Manhattan Mercury about the population drain in Kansas. We don't have that many young people anymore. Good point. We are an aging state, and that's not good. But we had enough in Saline County last year to beat the amendment. We had enough in but August to beat the amendment, but we didn't have enough people in September in November to to do it. Yeah. Sherman, how did the constitutional amendment do in the four congressional districts? Yeah, every congressional district, same result. It went down in every all four yeah. of them. Right. And that speaks to the issue. To me, that speaks to the issue. We raised two daughters. I want them to go vote. I don't care how they vote. I want them to go vote. And they do, pretty much all the time. And they were, uh, they were aggressive about vote, voting in August. I don't know how they voted. I don't ask those kind of questions. But they were intense. And they were getting their friends to go vote. And I just think the issue was just so salient to somebody who's 25 years old, you know? And so if you could, if you, if young people could sink their teeth into issues like that every election cycle, you would have those young voters. Maybe they're just not established enough to know the consequences of the public policy being made. Maybe they have to be 30, 35 or something. I don't know. I voted since I could when I was a teenager, but not everybody feels that way. I don't have an aunt. We don't. The Kansas Reflector does not have an answer for you. I do not know uh, I, uh, how to get young Americans to care enough to go vote. Perhaps if I did, I'd keep it a secret and go run for president. Uh, because, uh, wow. I just didn't know if you were aware of any of, of, any of the actions that some of these groups took in the, basically what, I mean, Lawrence, Kansas City, you know, all that, that area. Because they were all huge. I mean, we were hugely successful. I, I remember standing along the street and looking both directions from me and seeing 17-year-olds, 18-year-olds, all the way to 88-year-olds standing on the street with things, thinking how fabulous it was that these young people, these, they're, they're our future, and these young people were out here doing this, and how I, had just, how I just knew that once they got the taste of, of mm. this, that they would be back, and come November, you know, everything would be exactly yeah. the same. It, this is only part of your question, but maybe young progressive voters gravitate to urban centers, <coughs> and that's how Lawrence and, you know, Johnson County, Lenexa, and so forth, has a, a larger repository of younger voters that lean left. Yeah. You know, it's jobs and wherever they're living, because they, they want to live there for other reasons. I don't know how much longer you want to go, but one of the um, ideas for tonight was to hear sort of you, the session is over. Have you got any things we should be watching for? Have you already talked about that? Any, anything that you see coming up in the next session that are going to be important hot button issues? We probably have already identified most of them. Emily has a question or a comment. I have a comment before we move on. Is that okay? Mm -hmm.
I wonder if that's part of Democrats, particularly young Democrats, disappointment with Biden, that he hasn't made the progress that they had envisioned for him. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> One other question? Yes, sir. Have you guys done the math to see how many people in the legislature have received donations from the uh, guy that owns Genesis in Wichita? <laughs> <laughs> About half a dozen years ago, when he first started Genesis Fitness Clubs, I don't know if there's one around here, but they're everywhere. He's wildly successful. And uh, so half a dozen years ago, he came to the Capitol and kind of tried to get under the radar. And uh, the, he threw a bunch of money at the House and Senate tax committees. And uh, so what we did was um, we started looking. We wrote stories about all the donations to House and Senate members from Genesis. He doesn't do that anymore. He hides, it's dark money now. Uh, but uh, it passed the Senate and it was like, it got 23, 24 votes and almost all those people took money. And we, we said, you know, with a comment with so-and-so Senator uh, uh, and who received $400, $600, whatever from Genesis. So then it goes over to the House and it was in trouble over there because this is, you, this is a special interest tax break that would allow uh, a fitness clubs for some odd reason to not pay sales property. tax. Oh, he's he's tax. talked about property, property, property taxes, tax. okay. He's talked about sales taxes too, property taxes. It's just totally ridiculous. And uh, so in the house, there was this guy named Edmonds and I thought he's a great band or where he's from. Yeah. He'd been in the house for a decade, left, came back. Great sense of humor, three-piece pinstripe suit, and the Genesis people approached him like he was a freshman legislator, and they threatened him. <coughs> and we're gonna run you out of the legislature unless you vote with us. So he goes down on the House floor and starts reading off the senators who voted for it and how much money they got. So the bill in the House is already in trouble, and it, we'll say it had, it needs 63 to pass, it had 55. And uh, he got finished talking Clearly, he was ready to read the list of House of Representatives members and the money they had taken. <laughs> and so he went and sat down, and then there's a process where if you've cast your vote, you can raise your hand and change your vote on the House and Senate floor. And, and so it, people start peeling off the bill like crazy. And I, I don't know, I, maybe Mike O'Neill was speaker then. I think he just kind of threw up his hands. That's enough changes, let's just re-vote this. Everybody hit your buttons again. I think it got 17 votes when this is all over. And I just, there's always one moment in a legislative session that I can always think back on. A speech somebody gave or something, and I just remember that they pushed the buttons of the wrong guy that day. So Genesis continued to try to push for their special tax break. They hired, um, the, uh, form, uh, Jenkins, yeah. Lynn Jenkins to come in. She, has a, she quit Congress after 10 years and, and she created a lobbying firm. They thought, oh, bring the power. And she came in and she got it handed to her too. And I think they came back this year and you know, uh, I went to see DeSantis in Johnson County and DeSantis shows up late. Uh, I mean, uh, uh, DeSantis is speaking. The House Speaker and the Senate President come out of the back with the Genesis Fitness Club owner, <laughs> all right? And so I'm just thinking, oh, Genesis and his wife, uh, they flew up here in his private jet and they brought the Senate president and the House Speaker with them. And so they, and I knew this because when Genesis got up to leave, the other two guys went too, that was their ride home, you know? <laughs> and so I just thought, oh boy, we're gonna get Genesis tax breaks again in this legislative session, and we did. And I think they put a lot of work into trying to get it done. And it is outrageous, because every argument that guy had back in the day has been proven false. He claimed that the YWCA's were putting fitness clubs out of business. Yeah. <laughs> now, it is true in Wichita, there's a very robust YWCA <coughs> program. They have some nice facilities. But the YWCA in Topeka is about ready to go broke, you know? 
That's not the normal uh, thing. And in the intervening years, Genesis is now in like six states. They've got like 70 places. They look like Taj Mahals, but he still wants his tax break. So that guy will be back next year, and so will I. And one I of got the five sticking. more years to write trashy stories <laughs> about his tax break. One, one of the sticking points with this is Tim keeps also reporting all the unpaid taxes that they have. Oh, yeah. Oh, that God. killed it a couple of years ago because I looked at just three counties, and he owed like a half a million dollars in back taxes in three of the counties he was in. And so the House tax chairman, uh, I asked him about the bill after a hearing, and he just looked at me like, no, not after that story about his unpaid taxes. That's going nowhere. You know, so... <laughs> So, I mean, the audacity of somebody to come and ask for a mega tax break worth millions of dollars when you can't pay your taxes locally. Did not our state senator speak in favor of the, of the tax break on the floor? Say that again? Did not our state senator J. R. Clay. Oh, J.R. Clay? Possibly. Probably. I don't know. It, it, it might. That might be the case. I mean, you go back, and it's they have to really kind of chew hard and on their tongues to talk about why this is essential part of tax policy, you know? Anyway, sorry to tell you that long-winded little item, but I have yeah. one more question on the yes, Genesis sir. thing. The state law, the way I understand it is, is after your three years in arrears, the county may and should, and is supposed to, foreclose on your property. So now, what, is what does he, he do? He Wait up right until anywhere? the... The three, right before the three years and pay his taxes? Oh, that's what I want to know. If he's three years in arrears and Republicans are all about enforcing the laws, yeah. why yeah, isn't Kovac and the uh, I don't know, but it sounds like you just gave me a homework county. assignment. That'll be on his case. I didn't know about this three-year thing. Well, it's a simple state law. It's been there for There's a bunch years. of laws. There's a bunch of silly laws. And I don't it's know. not silly. They, no, no this is a good law. I'm just years. saying there's a lot of laws Sometimes. there for me to read and, you know. Yes. I have a quick uh, question about Alex. Um, he said he's going to be working on So do you think they just believe it's good business to be a contributor to ALEC because that gives them uh, some gravitas with, with legislators, all these legislative leaders from all over the country that are coming there and, hey, you're my ALEC buddy. You remember we met at the convention in Florida, Naples, I think, this year? Uh, and so, so maybe that's part of it, I guess, you know? And, you know, if I'm a rich company, I'm going to give money to the Republicans and the Democrats, and that way I don't have to roll the dice with anybody. I'm just going to spread my money around. But in a state like Kansas, give it to the Republican leadership because for the last 30 years, uh, the Republicans have led the Kansas House and Senate. And I don't expect it's going to change in the next 30 years. So it's a good investment. Good luck with your insurance. I, you know. <laughs> At least you can still get insurance here in Kansas for your house. Yeah. Yeah. Not Florida. Not in Florida. Um, are you guys getting tired want some cake or no, I, can, <laughs> I can I can keep talking and wave my we, arms we can around to, and act we can silly stick around for one on ones while people get cake all due respect <laughs> <laughs> So how do you choose those? Or do you have to specifically focus 
on state story than the legislators. We'll write about There's anything that's, there, but that's interesting. So, so yeah. our, our mandate is covered the state house. And yeah. so we, and I did this at the Capitol Journal when I was in the state house bureau for 15 years. We, I define politics as broadly as you possibly can. And we have parachuted many, many times into cities and counties to write interesting stories because people might accuse me of writing this kind of story, that kind of story. All I really do is try to write the most interesting stories I can. And so if some city commissioner in Council Grove is screwing up in a miraculous way, I'm happy to write about it. You know, I went to Junction City recently and wrote a story about uh, how they want to build a gigantic slaughter, a beef slaughter yeah, facility, yeah, yeah. literally by people's house on the edge of town. And uh, just kind of the grassroots movement against that. So uh, that's really a, was a city hall creation. And they're just hunting jobs. They don't care what kind of jobs they are. And so and that's an example of how we would maybe cover something in a city county level. Uh, but we just can't, we can't go to the city commission meetings, you know, in Buckland. It has to be a story that we think is going to have statewide interest generally. Uh, and, and also is often a story that is not being well covered by local media. Like they, they may not have reporters available. Yeah, right. we don't yeah. Have yeah, there are a lot of news deserts <laughs> practically. As, in, as in somebody who spent which is 30 years working know, for right. local newspapers, what is happening is makes me want to cry. Yeah. And uh, I, I just, I'm mortified to think about the lack of coverage in local cities because and it's not just the big political stories and what the school board's doing and what the county commission and the city council. It's the high school. Nobody's covering the high school games. Nobody knows the debate team won the state debate title. Nothing. And I think it's terrible for communities. And yeah. the solution is I don't know, except we have, work for a nonprofit that actually is well funded. And we, we an unusual nonprofit, extraordinary nonprofit, we don't have to wander around asking you for money and you for money and you for money. They have fundraisers to do that. We can go do journalism. And, and we get to decide advantage. what we're writing about. Like we don't yeah. have to appease a publisher or anybody else. In three years, I've monitored. never had a meeting with anybody at the nonprofit, parent nonprofit in North Carolina about what I'm writing. And uh, you know, I had lots of liberty at the Capital Journal to write whatever I wanted. But sometimes they did come in and make a suggestion about something I should cover. Usually their ideas were terrible, uh, <laughs> but I would, but I'd have typically yeah. try to do it anyway because I try to please people. We would have to spend a couple weeks after the session writing stories about how downtown Topeka is the greatest downtown in the history of downtown. Absolutely <laughs> fantastic, you know. And you know, at the Lawrence Journal World, we had something called that was put out every year. It was this thick. It looked like a Sunday New York Times. It was called the Progress Edition, which made the assumption that we were making progress in Lawrence. <laughs> I, always had a, I always felt like we needed at least a thin section at the back. Said, and these are the stories about how Lawrence went backwards. You know. <laughs> so, any other concluding questions? One more. A lot of comments about Alex. So I'm trying to remember whether they can voucher that as an educational trip. I, I do. You're right. Uh, do you know? I, I've never been to an Alex conference. No, I mean, can you go to, <laughs> can you go to, a, can you go to a government association yeah. meeting for educational purposes to educate you about public policy and, right. and voucher that with a state? Um, so I went to Providence, Rhode Island in June for a task force on higher education. Uh -huh. And that was paid for by the National Conference of State Legislators. And that organization does receive membership funding from the Kansas legislature. Mm -hmm. But it's very um, indirect. But it's different. Per I, se. I, I don't know why these legislators would need scholarships because they can, they can just use their campaign accounts to do whatever they want, right? You know, they could pay for it like that. Uh, I think a bunch of the people from Kansas that went to ALEC this year went on a week-long cruise afterwards, and I'm kind of curious who paid for that. <laughs> <laughs> that, would, that would be meals and hospitality. 
<laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Um, I, I never went to an Allen meeting either, but I was offered uh, by Time Masters. He kept trying to get me a thousand dollar scholarship to go, and I said that's a waste of money. And uh, and so I. Uh, Do you think I it was a state but, from the legislature the money, or was it? Oh, from Alec. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And um, so they, um, and I do know that I went to um, an elections um, uh, forum in uh, in Virginia, and uh, the state provided my um, registration fee to get there. Okay. But I had to pay out of my campaign funds the airfare and the yeah. you know, all the other expenses, and and so uh, mileage, and so your uh, a lot of Okay, well I think we can all agree, journalism is great, independent journalism is better, uh, but thank you all for coming. Today.